Welcome to the first Green DNet conference in Lisbon. <clears throat> My name is Sebastian Overtür. I'm Professor of Environment Sustainable Development at the Flemish Free University of Brussels, the Freie Universiteit Brussel, and also Professor of uh, Environmental Policy and Law at the University of Eastern Finland. I'm not least the scientific coordinator of the Green Deal Net Network. Um, and in this session, we'll have after me, obviously, Miranda Schröers. I'll introduce her later on. Uh, but I will first take a few minutes to introduce Green Deal Net, governing the EU's transition towards climate neutrality and sustainability. Um, is uh, a joint effort by 12 core project partners, but also a much bigger group of institutions and individuals across Europe and the world. We'll come to that later on. I uh, will not read all the partners, but we'll continue with what Green Deal Net actually is in substance. Um, so the Green Deal Net is a Jean Monnet network, which is under Erasmus Plus, the program of the European Commission. It started in September of last year, and it will continue until August 2025, so three years, 12 core project partners, and as we will later on see an extended network of associate members and experts. And it's building on the previous Jean Monnet network, GovTran. So what does Green Deal Net try to achieve? Um, aims to provide a platform for cooperation and exchange on European climate and sustainability governance. And we have basically two big baskets, or three if you wish, research and teaching, um, but also engagement and debate with policymakers and the broader public, which is the major focus of the conference today. Um, <clears throat> so that's really, I want to stress that that's important for us to have this engagement and debate with, the, with society and with policymakers. We have an advisory board. I will not run through that, um, but just so that you see that we have one, we continue. Um, and then go a little bit into the project structure. We have obviously project coordination, but then you see already the focus of the of the network uh, reflected in the in the work packages, work package uh, two platform, but then three research cooperation, four teaching, five debating and work package six impact and dissemination more important than the structure perhaps is the substance of what we are aiming to do we have ex uh, events and exchanges roundtable debates and keynotes so today we have roundtable debates and keynotes actually uh, we have international conferences today is the first one Academic conference panels, you will see at various academic conferences across Europe and the world. Um, we organize something that's called Policy Link Workshops, where we bring academics, policymakers, and other stakeholders together to discuss certain issues in the context of the Green Deal. We organize workshops on research and teaching collaboration, which we also did yesterday here in Lisbon. Uh, we foster exchange research visits across the network. Various publications are being produced, special issues, state-of-the-art reviews that try to synthesize knowledge in certain areas, an edited book, and policy impact papers, again, uh, the, the policy orientation, and um, various learning formats, uh, lecture series, a PhD school, and a MOOC that will launch at the end of this year. And finally, also outreach, policy briefs, blog posts, OPEDs, pretty standard, right? Podcasts and interviews. The first three podcasts are online. Have a look. Uh, quarterly newsletters, but then also something that's produced twice a year, which we call research highlights, which are really bringing out, trying to bring out policy lessons that arise from research results. And we distribute that in very short form to policymakers uh, and other stakeholders. We have a website that's very clear and social media presence, greendealnet.eu, and an expert da database that can be used to identify experts in uh, all kinds of sub areas of the Green Deal. Um, the substance, a little bit. Addressing the complex set of interlocking challenges in governance, policy and law, related to sustainability and climate. Um, so let me go a little bit into that, uh, what, what that means, how we see that. Um, 
well, at least how I see it. Um, next, please. <clears throat> and we start from the notion that climate and sustainability and governing that is a super wicked problem, right? And where super wicked may just mean it's very complicated, uh, as, as the picture seems to suggest, there are certain elements perhaps that deserve highlighting. It's very clear that climate and sustainability are an urgent challenge, right? Which is what the science tells us. It's um, important to keep in mind that it's long-term, the challenge. It's not something that we re resolve just in one year or with one decision. We need decision-making structures that uh, work over the long-term towards climate neutrality and sustainability. It's a cross-sectoral challenge that requires a whole of society, a whole of economy approach. Uh, which is also important to keep in mind when we design the solutions and governance. And it's uh, dynamism and complexity. Uh, and as I said, well, like complexity, everything is complex, uh, but a few things worth keeping in mind. Several of the impacts that we're dealing with that we're trying to avoid, actually, uh, are irreversible, right? If the Gulf Stream stops, it will have stopped. Uh, we can't bring it back. If species get extinct, they are extinct. They are not coming back. There's also non-linearity. There's exponential uh, growth of impacts, which our minds don't really cope with well. You know, there are all these stories that we already know also from the COVID pandemic. If it's exponential, it's difficult to grasp that it's going to be very urgent in a short time, even if it doesn't look that urgent right now. There are tipping points beyond which um, perhaps certain developments accelerate or certain impacts occur that weren't visible before in thresholds. Um, and there are lock-in and feedback effects where certain things can't be changed anymore or get reinforced, etc. Fortunately, what I'm saying here, I mean, I'm stressing kind of the problem and the challenge. Fortunately, some of this also is uh, true for some of the solutions, that they arise in nonlinear form and that they can also have exponential growth. Um, and I guess we'll hear some of that later on. Uh, and last but not least, um, <clears throat> it's contentious. It's contested. Every step in that governance and that transition that we need to master, the climate transition, the sustainability transition, is contested. And we can see that if we read the news every day. Uh, it's contested where we exactly should go with the transition, how the costs should be uh, distributed, um, who should pay for it, who should invest, um, where the windmills should, should be, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's important to keep in mind. That's the challenge. Um, and some something still about the interlocking aspects. Achieving net zero emissions and negative emissions that's established also in the European climate law uh, is very clearly there as one of the big challenges, the climate challenge. But there's also the biodiversity crisis and they're interlocking. If biodiversity gets reduced, and ecosystems um, get suffer from less biodiversity, they will also be have more difficulties in adapting to climate change. There are other planetary boundaries out there about water, chemicals, land systems, etc., that we need to take care of at the same time. There's the equity issue within and across societies, the just transition, etc., um, that we need to deal with. And eventually, there may be limits to material growth and sufficiency that we will need to discuss. And all of that under circumstances of increasing geopolitical turbulence, under circumstances where we all don't know where AI, artificial intelligence, will take us, where digitalization is advancing, so where other things in society are also changing quite a bit. Uh, so that is just the challenge that we try to think that through in this network and try to find solutions on, on how to deal with this. Um, so the climate and sustainability transition, that's perhaps one of the core messages, is about much more than reducing emissions. It's about all the other interconnected environmental and societal challenges. Um, and it's about how we take decisions together 
how we organize our societies. And all of that calls for a radical change of societal and institutional systems in a turbulent context. And radical, I have in quotation marks, not because it's not right, but it's not politically radical like left or right, but radical because it needs to get to the root of the problem, right? Um, so that's what, what, what some of the network is about. Um, next one. Um, and the second element, third element, I don't know, um, is that we are dealing with governance in the network. So not necessarily describing the problem, but then now focusing on what should we do um, in terms of governance to resolve and address the problem. And very clear that governance needs to be fit for purpose. It needs to fit all these problem characteristics that, that we saw before. So and that's why, why it's also important that we identify what the problem characteristics are. It's about defining, finding, designing the policies, institutions, and regulations that provide direction and incentivize the transition. But we're not only talking about public policies, but also the policies of private actors and uh, how they intersect. That brings me to the dis disciplines. The network is very strong in policy and law, which seem to be core disciplines when we think about governance. But it's also much more that needs to be much more. We need to have, and we do have, sociology in there, economics. Eventually, we need, I think, also um, psychologists who explain to us how the mind works of people that we need to change, uh, and much more. So it's a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary exercise. Yes, we are also very interested in climate art. So this is a piece of climate art, and it summarizes to some extent, some of the messages that I wanted to give. Next one, please. Um, <clears throat> so how can you then contribute to the network? Um, as I said, we have the 12 core partners, but we also have two other categories of associate members and experts. So associate members are institutions that want to collaborate in the network. Um, on research, teaching, and these debating activities that I mentioned, but also experts, individuals can join us uh, to contribute to that agenda that we are further developing. These two categories are not mutually exclusive, right? You can be an expert in an associate member institution and join us as such and be in the expert database. Um, <clears throat> As an associate member, you obviously can pitch in and everything that I mentioned before, the whole list of issues, contribute to special issues, participate in the PhD school, uh, contribute keynotes, roundtable debates, uh, either as participant or organizing them, uh, propose policy link workshops and papers, produce policy briefs, blog posts, opeds uh, in the context of the, of the network. We do have 22 associate members currently and obviously counting looking forward to those who want to join to contact us at info at greendealnet.eu and then the experts you see a few examples we have more 49 at the moment listed on the database in the database um, also there we try to foster dialogue with other experts policymakers and the media um, so you contribute also to all the activities um, or you can contribute if you become an expert um, and, and we'll try to involve you. This is how you can contact us, info at greendealnet.eu. We have the website, greendealnet.eu, and all kinds of social media channels, the usual ones. Um, so please have a look and get in touch um, if you find it of interest. <clears throat> 